Okay, so without further ado, let's get started with the first talk. It's about the event sourced content repository. Sebastian will give us a little recap on uh, what that project is all about, what event sourcing is uh, all about, and then, of course, uh, what the progress was since uh, last year and what the future plans are for the event sourced content repository. So. Uh, enjoy the talk by Sebastian Kurfürst about the event source content repository. Hi everybody, I'm really excited to talk about the event source content repository once again. <laughs> so um, let's just get started. Um, actually, um, NEOS is comprised of really many packages. So we have the NEOS user interface, uh, we have uh, the flow framework at the bottom, there's Fusion, there's the content repository, the asset storage, then the package called NEOS, uh, pulling it all together. And these packages are the main building blocks of NEOS. And in the past, we have changed quite some of them really dramatically. Just think about the NEOS user interface, where we changed it from Ember.js to React.js. Or think about Fusion, where we introduced AFX. And um, this talk is actually about um, introducing um, or, or changing the content repository in a really major way. So let's focus on that. And um, as we are talking about event sourcing, one of the core components is the event store itself. Um, the um, event store package, um, um, or, or the, the package doesn't just consist of the event sourcing, but we also have a read and a write side um, we need to take care about. So that means the package has a content graph, a command API, um, and many, many different components which need to fit together. So actually, what we are doing is a really, really big change behind the scenes. And this doesn't get even easier, but even bigger, because uh, NEOS and the NEOS user interface also take place in that. So that means also the packages on top of NEOS, uh, of, the, of, the, of the content repository, need to take part in that. So let's just see uh, why we are doing the rewrite. And that's so much work to do. So actually, why should we do that? And the reason is that we see very many gains. OK, we don't have a picture, I see. So probably we'll, we have to fix that for a second. Let's just wait. You know, it's live. So actually, <laughs> that's the difficulty sometimes. <laughs> Okay. So, while we're fixing the technical troubles, as you know, this is a live event and uh, Sebastian was just doing a live presentation, so things can happen, yeah. unexpected things. And you, you <laughs> if, if you could see all the cables there, right? We have a MacBook connected to three monitor outputs <laughs> and then, you know, if plug one it of them in, doesn't then work, then we don't have a picture. 60 so. hertz. So, this content repository thing, Robert. Yeah. Um, you, you were involved in this first workshop. Um, how many years ago was that? Two, three years ago? Um, about uh, talk, uh, thinking about the event sourced content repository. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah we um, actually we booked um, uh, Matthias Veras uh, to coach us or to, to uh, let's, let's say, um, approve our concept to do something like that um, because. It, the, the approach is a bit unusual to use event sourcing for that, and we haven't found any, any project doing that. So, of course, when you, when you look, look around and think like nev nobody has ever done that before, you get a bit suspicious if you're on the right track. That's, so. uh, w yes, if I remember correctly, then yesterday that was, that was called Not Invented Here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so we tried to avoid that, but there wasn't anything, and... Yeah, we didn't. We didn't find a reason against it, despite uh, the big effort to take. And I, I remember Sebastian came back from from this workshop, and he was like, 
his head was buzzing with all the stuff that you did. Um, the, the concepts were, I think, pretty new for, for, for most of the people involved at that workshop, right? Yeah. And um, why, why did you um, consult or invite Matthias Veras uh, to, to help with that? Well, he's, he's uh, very good at everything which is related to dom uh, domain-driven design and event sourcing as well. So that, that was obvious. And we also wanted to find out if there's a way to do that in some sort of backwards compatible way because the content repository is such an important bit uh, of NEAS, right? And uh, we can't just say, oh, now we come with a completely different uh, type of storage and you have to rewrite all your plugins and so on. So, But that is something that I is actually achievable, right? To have a backwards compatible, that it, there is a migration path once we have the event sourced content repository? It is achievable and we, we already do that and uh, that depends a lot on which APIs you had in the first place. So if you never define a good API, then it's really hard to replace um, the inner workings with a new solution, of course. Um, but the API is rather slim, uh, which we currently have, and so that's actually possible. So there are, there are a few behaviors which will be different, um, and of course, if you want to take full advantage of event sourcing, you will use new APIs as well. But um, yeah, so so that part is uh, you know different and will be different for the developers and from a editor point of view, will will that change much? No, that won't change, but. Let's let's ask uh, or let uh, let let uh, Sebastian tell us all about the inner workings and um, how event sourcing works again. So back to you, Sebastian. So hi everybody again. Uh, I'm really thrilled to have this talk, and you know what sometimes goes wrong. This time it was just a really tiny USB-C connector which has a wackel contact. So, <laughs> but it was a bit hard to find that. So, uh, thanks for your patience. So let's get back to event sourcing. Um, if we check out NEOS, NEOS is actually comprised of very many packages. So that means we have the Flow Framework at the bottom, we have the NEOS user interface at the top, then there, there are some kind of packages for specific functionality like Fusion for the rendering or the asset storage or the content repository. And actually, as you know, we, we have the habit of changing these packets quite dramatically over time when we see big benefits there. So this time we are looking at the content repository and the big changes we are planning there. And um, event sourcing has to do something with events. So a component called an event store is a central piece. But that's not the only part. Actually, um, you need uh, or we are also changing stuff like uh, the content graph, the commands API and all kinds of things. So basically we are pulling out the package all together and place it uh, in a new way. So that means it's a really, really, really big change behind the scenes. And this change even gets a lot bigger because, you know, there are some packages depending on the content repository on top, which is the NEOS user interface and uh, the NEOS UI um, being placed on top of this uh, content repository package. So that needs to be changed as well. So. Why are we actually doing this rewrite uh, when it's so much work? Actually, it's because we see so many huge gains and a very, very big long-term benefit. So let's just quickly recap what event sourcing is about, just to get everybody on the same page so that we can follow along really nicely. In a classical database architecture, you know, not event sourced, um, the world looks pretty easy actually at first sight. You have your database and you have some model which you usually store in your database and you just modify the stuff and you read from this. Um, just pretty simple. But in the event sourced world actually things um, look pretty much the same. So <laughs> but the only difference is instead of um, a database you use the event store and instead of your model you change your, your, your store your events. So that means what is actually an event? An event is stuff like 
I updated a node, um, I created a node, I changed some properties, I created a workspace, these ki kind of things. So actually an event is an historical, um, or an event log is an historical point in time, uh, an historical record of all changes being done to the system. And the difference is that in the classical architecture, so to speak, you only store the current snapshot of the system. And when you change something, you override this um, current state. In the event source idea, you the idea is that you store all the different parts of the history. So that means um, you don't just have access to the current state, but also to the full history available. And technically, instead of writing, we call that appending events. Instead of reading, we call that updating projections. But that's just technical details of how this actually works in, in the, in, um, um, under the hood. So how let's now focus on this updating projections part. How does this actually work? So a projection is um, basically something like the old, uh, it's something we call a read model. So that means it's basically your old model. That's just a good analogy you can, you can start with at the beginning. So that means your classical database tables you, you are accustomed to actually uh, is the stuff we have, we have um, uh, in place. And um, when new events come in, what we're actually doing is we update the projection one by one. And um, we, we can use Doctrine, for instance, but usually what we are doing is we are just doing it on plain SQL because that gives a huge performance benefit. So that means we only use Doctrine DBAL, the database abstraction layer, instead of the object relational mapper, the ORM. And um, there's one really big benefit um, from this mind shift of um, starting with the events and not with the model. And that is that the model, the projection, can be rebuilt. How does this work? Well, actually, it's pretty simple. First, just throw away your whole data, throw away the whole projection, and then start, because we still have the historic uh, event log in place, which is the main record of what has actually happened. So that means we can start applying the first event um, to the database table, and then we have the state of just the first um, point in time um, available. And then we can start applying the second event, the third event, and so on and so on, until we have caught up and the database, our projection is again up to speed. So to give you another perspective how this all fits together and to introduce some important concepts, um, let's just follow along a user action like creating a node. The first thing is the command. A command captures the user's intention. So that means it's basically saying, please create a node for me. Because of, uh, we, we then convert that to a so-called event, and we store that event in the event store. And the event store is basically the historic point in time saying, you know, this user has created this and that node. That means the event is the recorded intention of the user. And then, we can update the projections one by one. So we have a projection called Content Graph, which is our main projection. Uh, um, but we also have additional projections, like the routing projection, which is new, which we'll be talking about uh, really soon. And you can add more and more and more projections. These two sides are called right side and read side. Um, so I always remember that right side is because it's on the right side. So that's the way you see it on the picture right now. Um, and the interesting part is, is that um, between the write and the read side, you can have some asynchronity available, which is a huge point for scaling out later on. So what is actually the benefit of this kind of architecture? Actually, we know what has happened. We know every single state change of the system, and not just of the last week, but of all the time in the whole system. So that means we could do something like an audit log on top, you know, but that's very hard to get right. And actually, we tried to place an audit log on top of the current NEOS architecture, and it was really hard to get that in a somehow working state. With the event sourced architecture, the audit log is like at the core of the system. It is the truth. And that is a really powerful um, way of thinking. By that, we can also um, create really well working history and undo and redo functionality. It's nothing we have done so far, but it's something where we want to lay the foundation for. 
Additionally, because we have access of all the changes one by one, you can think about very many functionalities which we can put on top of that. So one example is editing notifications. I personally would like to have a feature like saying, if a certain part of the website is changed, I would like to be notified um, um, so that I have to change the English version of the website, for instance. We could do st stuff like synchronization. So that means we have two NEOS instances available, and the one NEOS instance will automatically push some changes to the new NEOS instance. And I think this will, in the long run, help us to really scale out to very, very flexible and big projects. And if you have followed along with NEOS conference in the last years, um, you will have heard already a few talks about NEOS con uh, about the event sourcing. So actually, it has been already five years in the making, which is, of course, a really, really long time in terms of software. So we started actually in uh, December 2016 uh, with the first uh, workshop. That were the first ideas um, uh, which we which we tried to flesh out there. We had an external consultant, uh, Matthias Veres, there, and he helped us debunk all our myths about event sourcing and really helped us focus on the core ideas of what we are doing. And then we had some workshops, uh, for instance, in Kiel, where we discussed many of the important concepts and uh, discovered them as we went along. And we did the first like baby implementation steps. It was extremely rough still, but we had the idea, OK, it might eventually work out. Then we met again in Dresden in a, in a workshop just focusing on the event source content repository. And you know that was pre-COVID, so we were actually able to meet in person. <laughs> that was really nice. <laughs> And then we were able to show our current state in Hamburg at the NEOS conference. And we had a prototype by then. So that means we forked NEOS completely. We just did the changes we needed to do to figure out if this is would actually might work out in some sense. And what we did actually only worked on a demo site. It was not possible at all to use it on any custom site. It was uh, extremely at the feasibility and performance study stage. Then, in 2019, um, on the NEOS conference in Dresden, it was no, not a fork anymore, and that's where we released the Alpha 1 version. We said, OK, this will actually work out. We are really confident that this is the way forward in the longer run. Then, last year, on NEOS conference online, I explained that we did various improvements in the NEOS upper layer. So that means we worked especially in the integration with NEOS and made sure that many of the functionalities we expect are needed. And we actually got the first like test version of a bigger website, which was the Docs Neos IO site up and running. And we did a lot of stabilization efforts. So the question now is, what actually did we do since last year? And of course, we all want to use it for real. So that means I want to use the content repository, the event source content repository on a real project really soon. So we sat together last summer um, and we did an partially online and partially uh, real-world sprint. So that means Bernhard joined me in Dresden, and uh, Robert joined us remotely. And we thought really hard, what actually do we need to run this in production? And we came up with three missing features, which we needed to fix. So the first thing is, we need to deal with changes. That means changes in the external world, changes like changes to the node types in the system. And there are two kinds of changes we need to adjust, uh, uh, we need to cater for there. So at some point, we have automatically adjustable things. So stuff which currently is running with node repair. We now call that structure adjustments, and that was a big feature we have been working on on the sprint last summer. The second uh, big feature were um, planned uh, manual node type changes. So that means node migrations needed to be built because we knew when um, you know we, we couldn't ship the first version without node migrations because we just needed this to get out of dead ends in production. And then we thought really hard, well, actually, <laughs> there are bugs in the system. We don't know them, and that's the difficult part, obviously. You know, um, We just know there will be some, but we have no way of finding what the bugs actually are. So they are unplanned, obviously. So we thought about a feature called integrity violation detection, and that's what I'm just showing in a bit. Um, the idea is that um, the content repository itself knows 
what, you know, if it's internally consistent or not. And we have come up with a lot of um, different checks. So actually, there are 15 checks in the system, which, for instance, check that a node is connected to the root node. You know, it should never, 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 ever happen in our system that a node is not connected to the root of, 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 a, of the page, basically. But it's just, you know, if it's dangling around, that is definitely a bug. And we know this is a bug. So what we did is we created these, uh, these automatic checks uh, where you see the documentation, the inline documentation here, which explains the, the different scenarios. And for these checks, um, you know, if they happen in production, what you can actually do is you can send us your events or parts of the events. And this way, we can exactly reproduce at which point in time was the error introduced. And this gives us very, very easy ways to fix that. And that makes us really confident to actually get up and running. So that was last summer. So that was basically the state a bit after uh, um, um, the sprint in, in summer last year. And well, there's one thing actually. In, in, I think, between July and November, not really many things happened. Um, and there's a reason for that. Uh, last year, I, I had the slide like this. I said, we have four hours of coding, one hour of thinking, and one hour of discussing to get new insights. And I said, this is like my personal brain nut. But actually, <laughs> it's not true. To me, right now, the world looks like this. We have like one hour of coding, two hours of thinking, then four hours of discussion, and then new insights come. So that means, this topic is, f well, at least the details of the topic are really deep and we need to think really slowly through them. And the topic is a bit hard to get into. You know, that's not something you do just with one hour of spare time, but you actually need like half a day to get up and running really, really nicely. So that's why we as the core team decided in December to take 10 kilo, 10,000 euros out of our funding and um, from the NEOS budget and just kickstart this effort once again, just to give us the energy to work in a big, bigger, bit bigger chunks. Um, so that means Bastian and me were able to pick up the work just on a regular basis again and again. And then some things happened. And these are the things which I'm going to show step by step now. So first, I'm going to talk about the smaller features in the system. Then we're going to talk about event source routing, the performance and the Postgres support, and node accessors. So I'm first focusing on the smaller features in the system which we just built because, uh, uh, well, one of us had the personal itch to do that, and we thought, oh, yeah, that would be useful. So let's focus on them. First, we did many cleanups um, in, in the smaller functionality of the system, especially how we handle properties. So that means a node has certain properties. And in the old system, in the current content repository, you just can insert strings and just simple properties in there, but nothing really complex. And what we support now is uh, arbitrary value objects in here. So that means um, it's, it's supporting arbitrary things in there. And we did that by um, having customizable property serializers. So that means we used the Symfony serializer package to serialize and deserialize all the different data in and out. And this is very helpful and extensible. Then um, I think Bernhard in some <laughs> some uh, idea session and uh, he was really quick to implement or to start implementing access control support. So that means um, we want to be able to, to ask the content repository if certain nodes are, are visible for a certain user group or not. And we want to be able to do that efficiently. And that's what, what Bernhard has drafted out. And then an, a feature which I'm really happy about is called property scopes. Um, so that is... Um, uh, the idea that um, you have uh, a node in two languages, so if let's say a product, we have that in German and in English, and of course the title is different, but there are certain properties like the SKU number, the internal identifier, the price, which should be the same in all dimensions. And the idea about property scopes is that this makes this possible. So that means you will be able to say these properties should be the same across this pool of dimensions, and the system will enforce that. So that's actually really, really nice. Right. So let's talk about event-sourced routing. And I'm really, really happy um, 
you know, we have been working in it. That's really a team effort. And Bastian and Bernhard are really our, my partners in crime here. We have been doing so much work together. So, um, yeah, let's see if we can get a call to Bastian. And we can just chat with him about the event source routing. Let's see. Bastian, are you around? Actually, that's Bernhard. We'll I'm not Bastian. We'll, <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk in a bit. <laughs> Hi, Bastian. Nice I was to see confused you. about myself. It <laughs> <laughs> was probably another little Kurzschluss in our connection. <laughs> <laughs> so nice yeah. to see you. Good to see you. So yeah. are you doing well right now? Absolutely. Awesome. That's Great really, really cool. Yeah. So can you tell us a bit about why you actually started on the routing ideas? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, maybe to zoom out a little, bit, um, as you said, like one of the uh, power features of event sourcing is the ability to have like these multiple uh, read models, and and certainly the the content graph Bernhard will talk more about, I guess, uh, is is our main read model, and that's the one you you're gonna uh, work with most of the time, and it's optimized for all the common queries you, you want to post to a content repository. But, uh, well, there are some, some queries that are uh, not, not easy to, to uh, make them really performant. Like, uh, I mean, obviously the temporal ones you were talking about, like, like now uh, what nodes have changed in the last X minutes, you have to go through all the nodes to find that, uh, but also like really simple queries, like even c count all the nodes in the repository is not as easy as you would think because all, of all the fallbacks and th things. And, and routing is another example for that. Like, like so from, from going from the, the URL to find out which node to load, there's no shortcut then to go through all the URL segments and find the corresponding node in that dimension and so on. So, so that's that's why we said like this would be a very good example for for another projection that is dedicated to answering exactly that request. But, yeah. but but don't you just need it like on the start of the request in terms of you know like when you when you ha hit a certain URL that you find the node is that just isn't that just the only place where this is actually kicking in? Uh, well. For, for the incoming uh, request, of course, but then, the, 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 then, of course, also when you want to create a link on the page, ah, right. you have to go the other way around. <laughs> so, so I guess that's the most performance critical part, right? If you have like hundreds of links in a menu, for instance, and you want to render this, and that's probably where this hits, actually. I exactly, and that's, all, that's today also really uh, 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 a problem performance-wise, and so we... Um, oh sorry, I hear the, your, your guys in the... <laughs> uh, sorry, in the back, I think uh, Bastian is hearing you. <laughs> it's too early uh, in the morning to, to be able to <laughs> talk <laughs> with voices in my head. Um, um, so, uh, no, so that's already... Today, it's also a performance problem to, uh, to create a lot of links, and that's why we have, uh, of course, we have this caching layers. Um, and, um, but as you know, caching is always uh, a hard really hard to work yeah. with. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and also, you know, like I realized just the other day that, that today, if you change anything on the home page, all the routing caches for all the pages underneath, so basically all pages, is flushed. So that means uh, that that the next visitor hits the cold cache, and you have to, so you have performance issues with that. And so that that was the reason why we said like this would be a very good case for a, for a dedicated read model, where we basically just need uh, the URL and uh, uh, the corresponding node identifier, and then it's just a really quick uh, select statement, and you don't even need any caches. So so that basically means we will be able just to improve. You know, basically we don't try to quick fix the solution in terms of adding caches and caches and caches, but rather we try to make the original solution really really fast. And is it right that like the trick is to move the logic from the time where we actually read things to the time where we actually write things, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and it's not only to make it faster, uh, but also 
uh, we can you know make it easier to extend basically and and uh, that that's the goal but but especially to make it fast and right it's 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 moving the complex parts to the right side um, and because it's that that doesn't mean that when you want to change something that you're blocked in the nearest UI but uh, well, it's eventually consistent. That means like in the, you change something, and in the background, it will repair the, the corresponding route for you. And so, so it, it will be not immediately there, but like we're, we're talking about milliseconds here, so mm -hmm. you won't even realize. And what would you say would be like the, was the most challenging aspect of doing all that and implementing all that? Well, yeah, <laughs> it was surprisingly hard, to be honest. Uh, so... As you said, like a projection itself, it's, it's really easy. It's basically just a function that gets a, the current state and it, an event, and then it, it applies the event to the state. And uh, um, so, so uh, we d we don't even have that many event types. It's like we're talking about ten to fifteen relevant events. Like you know, a node is created, of course, then I add a corresponding route. Mm -hmm. When the node is deleted, I remove it, and so on. But the the whole hierarchical uh, aspect makes it hard because you have to um, your projections have to be um, independent from from any other context so you have to be able to re run them and that means they have to keep all the curse the, the relevant state and for example uh, when you add a node and then you add some child nodes and then you remove the the parent node you have to know all, all about the that you have the child nodes are underneath it this is Pretty clear, but but there were some parts that I didn't have in mind before we started doing this. Like, for example, when, if you disable a node, I, I would say, well, it's it's not relevant for the routing anymore. So I would say, well, we can just remove it from the read model. But then, of course, you can re-enable it, and the re-enable event, of course, only contains the information that this node was re-enabled. So I need to keep track of its state. So we we have to add a flag saying that it's disabled. But then you have, like, if, if you have a, a node that is disabled and you have another child node that is also disabled, and then you enable the parent node, the child node still needs to be disabled. So it can't be just the flags, but we have to, you know, keep track of that. Or, or the, the most difficult part actually was, uh, and I didn't really <laughs> expect that, but uh, the uh, sh uh, shortcut nodes, especially shortcuts uh, mm -hmm. pointing to the first child nodes. Because that means now we need to keep track of what is the first child node, and it, mm -hmm. we and it's not only enough to just remember what is my first child node. Because if that first child node is disabled or removed, then the second child node gets the first <laughs> child node. So we need to keep yeah. track of that all. And <laughs> so yeah, that was hard. <laughs> awesome. So that is you know on the one side really complex, but on the other side, I think from the user's perspective, it's really easy. So thank you so much, Bastian, for giving us these insights. Um, really cool to see you. I'm really looking forward to see you in person uh, at some point in the future, really soon, hopefully. And yeah, I'm really glad uh, that we are through this together. And it's really a lot of fun to do that. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Just one thing I want yeah. to add. Uh, I, I didn't tell you before, but, but I, I okay. actually started working on some components to make exactly that reusable for Mm -hmm. third-party projections or ah. even for other parts of the core because that's <laughs> all the problems I just described are not not specific to routing it's you always if you have to deal with mm -hmm. with uh, hierarchical nice. data yeah. that, that is uh, so so that's that, that will be much easier for for other people to create those projections really cool so yeah cool thank you thank I'm, you I'm really so much. looking forward to our next discussion yeah <laughs> thank you of, uh, definitely so Let's um, first um, let's have um, talk about Ber with Bernhard really soon. But first, I would like to uh, get some you know get the stage set up um, um, because you know Bernhard will talk a lot about graphs in all kinds of fashion. So before we talk about the performance and the Postgres support with Bernhard, actually, I want to give you a short excourse on the content graph. So, you know, when we talk, you will hear, hear stuff like node, edge, color, and content stream, and you know, this you might wonder what this is actually mean. And actually, it sounds way more complex than it is. So let's focus on the basics. The central part is a node, stuff like a homepage node, or um, a, a node um, 
called 2022 and with the title next year. Then we have edges between, um, and an edge is just connecting these two nodes together. And basically on an edge, it's saying which workspace this node is in. And for technical reasons, we are not talking about workspaces here, but about content streams. But that's just really, really minor detail. So that means basically it's saying in the live workspace, the uh, homepage node is connected with a 2022 node. And in my user workspace, um, we, we pull in the same edge. So that means we have, um, for, for two workspaces, we have two edges between all the nodes. And the idea behind that is if we change something, um, we actually we can do something called copy on write. We will be able to change only the node for parts which have changed. And this way, actually, modifications are really, really efficient. And it's not just uh, it's not just the workspace which is relevant. There's another factor which is interesting, and that is actually um, the um, the language, um, so that means the dimension space point, um, the dimension we are in. So that means each edge um, connecting two nodes doesn't only have a workspace at there, but also um, um, also um, um, a dimension space point. So that means it's saying all the orange edges are basically the German edges, the white edges now are the, uh, the English edges here. And if we now only change, in my personal workspace, the English version, then we only have to change one of these edges together and modify that. And um, this whole construct is what we call the content graph. And for m many reasons or in many scenarios, you are only interested on a part of the content graph because you're only interested in the German version of the live website, for instance. And this part is what we call a subgraph. And actually, it's a tree of nodes, which we can work with then pretty easily. So that means the content graph is the whole thing. And the subgraph is just the part of the, gr of the graph which is visible right now in a certain dimension and content stream. Right. So after this X course, I think uh, we are ready to uh, talk to Bernhard, and I'm really looking forward to that. So hi, Bernhard. Nice to see you. Hello, fellow Neosians. <laughs> uh, hello, Sebastian. Nice to see you, too. Really cool to have you. So uh, what do you think is so cool about these kind of graphs you are working with? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> no, it's, it's a really flexible data structure. I mean, you can do all sorts of things with it. And if you look at the internet, it's 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 basically a graph. Things are linked. Uh, there are. Um, it's called hypertext for a reason. Uh, everything is connected somehow. And if you can just um, project that into the database and use this as your model, you're basically there where you want to be. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you have been working on Postgres, I think, the Postgres support recently, and I heard that our graph has gained some new exciting features about that. So just tell us about that. Yeah, sure thing. So um, the original idea was uh, that we had uh, certain performance problems with like for uh, content stream forking. So um, I, I've prepared something. Oh, nice. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> yep, that's this. And... Um, uh, you have this content graph here on the left side, which is, for example, the live content stream. And now you log in as a new user and you get that uh, your, cu your um, custom content stream as a variant of the original one. And um, all the hierarchy relations have to be copied for that. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what you said just a few minutes ago. And um, this doesn't seem to be uh, that much of a problem because we don't have to copy all the nodes, but only the relations. Um, but is, this gets a problem when you have like 500,000 relations. And um, well, I built up a little testing script that created uh, six levels of nodes with 10 children per parent. So we ended up with um, 100,000 nodes. And there were five languages involved, so we ended up with 500,000 relations. And that took about 30 seconds mm -hmm. uh, to fork a content stream to, for example, which happens all over the place. Like when you publish, you get a new content stream for your um, editor, and you don't really want to wait 30 seconds on that. <laughs> Definitely not, yeah. So um, one of the ideas of using Postgres is that uh, Postgres is supposedly uh, quite a bit faster than MySQL or MariaDB. 
Um, so um, I started working on that. But um, well, Postgres besides speed does have a few other really nice features that uh, play into our hands. Like um, you can store multiple values, uh, arrays of values and in columns and uh, of course also JSON. And uh, Postgres is able to index and really understand JSON and those arrays. Um, the first idea that uh, comes to mind is uh, properties, right? Uh, yeah. Properties are stored as JSON in the database. Uh, so you can put an index on that and, for example, um, yeah, give me all my, uh, my news uh, postings and sort them by their uh, um, publication date property and only return 20 of them or so, something like that. Uh, nowadays, you use Elasticsearch for that, mm -hmm. and that won't be necessary uh, once we have Postgres support. Nice. Um, but uh, although this is a really valuable feature by itself, it's actually one of the rather boring ones. <laughs> so, um, and we still have that uh, problem with performance on Content Stream 4 Geek. Um, but you can use those multi-value fields for other purposes as well. For example, if you look at three nodes, uh, three relations here, they have something in common. They have the same parent, mm -hmm. they have the same content stream identifier, they have the same dimension space point. The only thing that differs is the child node anchor. But um, we can use the, um, a multi-value field for the child nodes, so uh, we can do this. So this is basically one relation from the parent to all of its children. And when you fork this, you don't have to copy like six uh, relations as in the previous example, but only three in this example. And this gets even more extreme if you have uh, rather flat trees. Like for example, if you have a, um, a product catalog with one catalog node and 50,000 um, products beneath that catalog, that uh, means instead of 50,000 relations, you only need one. And this is really f uh, fast when being copied. Um, for example, um, in this uh, demo graph I built with the 500,000 relations, we actually, um, well, there, there were 500,000 relations in the MySQL graph, but um, only 50,000 relations um, in the uh, so-called hypergraph in Postgres. So it's, it's called a hypergraph because um, these are hyperrelations by definition because they connect more than uh, one, uh, more than two nodes, but an arbitrary number. And uh, this uh, isn't only the mathematically correct term, it, only is, uh, it also sounds awesome. <laughs> but what's most awesome about this is uh, that these, uh, these uh, copying of the relations, um, because they're uh, much fewer than now, this doesn't take like 30 seconds, but only two. Nice. So um, that's an amount of time I think an editor can uh, deal with when, deal when using a system with 500,000 nodes, for example. Awesome. So that means actually, will, will the end user notice any of these like hyper stuff in the background? I mean, like, does that change any API to the outside? Uh, no. That's, uh, it uh, doesn't have any effect. We can implement the same interfaces, um, both on the read and write side. It's just in implementation detail uh, in the in the database storage. Really cool. So yeah, thank you so much for showing us that. Yeah, that's yeah, that's that's but that's only one thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this gets even uh, more interesting when we come to restriction relations. Uh, so, for example, if you disable one node, then all of its descendants have to be disabled as well. So we um, connect this parent to all descendants. And um, yeah, this gets, uh, yeah, you, you may see this is modern art rather. <laughs> um, this uh, really many uh, relations have to be copied. And this um, can be simplified a lot in the hypergraph because you only have one restriction relation now that connects one parent to all of its descendants. And while we're at it, when we have a construct like this, and we have multi-value fields. What we also can do is that we just say, ah, this uh, restriction for whom 
is it effective? So who is, has access to this uh, part of the graph? And that's you have only to add one field in Postgres and you have now complete uh, read side access control. And these are so-called access control relations. Um, they are currently in progress of being developed. There's absolutely nothing I see that should be a problem there. And um, I don't know whether we can support this uh, in, in MySQL, but it will be a core feature in Postgres. Really, really nice, definitely. I think that it, that shows just how flexible we are with this architecture and like how well we will be able to scale that. And I think that shows also really well like the difference between on the one side we get the core feature really stable and on the other side we start to experiment in all kinds of direction. And I'm really glad uh, that you are doing all these Postgres experiments and especially this, this performance benefits are so tremendous. So that's really cool. So uh, and we haven't even started with graph databases. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know that. Actually, that's something you really want to do. So thank you so much, Bernhard. Uh, it's really been a pleasure to have you. Um, I'm really looking forward to see you in person really, really soon, as soon as the pandemic has gone down a bit. So thank you so much. And yeah. it was great to have you. Thank you. All right. So there's one more thing I would like to show. and. Um, then we are at the end of this talk. So there's one part we would like to explain a bit better, which is the, no um, the way you access the nodes in the system. Um, because there's, there was a rather big um, change in APIs, which we have been doing just uh, a while ago, and it was rather accidental, um, so it was not so planned. And actually, um, if you look closely, our nodes, like in the current system, they have two parts. There is a data access part, so you can access properties, but there's also a data traversal part, so you can get from one node to the next node to the next node. And what we ended up with is tearing apart these two parts and moving the traversal part out of the node um, itself. Why is that actually useful? Well, the idea is that the upper layers of the system, like the NEOS user interface, the menu rendering and Fusion and these kind of things, they actually should call the node accessor API. So that's the outside central API. And this node accessor API delegates to the storage API, which is the content subgraph. And the reason for that is extensibility. So that means what we would like to play around with is stuff like the following. Uh, we would like to be able to insert virtual nodes, for instance, in the data structure. So that means by adding a virtual node accessor in front of the subgraph node accessor, we can do stuff like a virtual node implementation based on some arbitrary rules. Um, so these nodes should show up in the menu, in the NEOS backend, and so and on and so on. And that's an extension point on the read side, which we think is really nice and which we would li really like to play around with. And that's actually rather work in progress, so that's not yet merged, but that's something uh, like <laughs> uh, when the conference now is all packed in again, and then I'll start working on that uh, again and fix all the tests uh, and continue working on that. So I hope that is really like the, the last big API changing feature we have been, we are currently doing. Right, so let's just quickly talk about the next steps and the roadmap. So actually, the roadmap is pretty much like last year. So we are still, um, you know, want to get the first version of the website of a website really up and running for a long term, um, and that's the next step. Um, we have found in the last year that there were some things which are still hin hi hindering us on that, which we've improved by that, and um, and which we've removed the obstacles. And so now we we are really close to this point in time. And Actually, I would like to make this whole ecosystem, this whole event source content repository way, way more approachable to, um, to all of you. And I know that, you know, these kind of talks might be somehow intimidating just because, you know, it's all kinds of different weird language, which is a bit different than we have using right now and so on. So that's why I would like to host some kind of webinar, QA session, deep dive, whatever you name that, um, in two weeks from now on the 21st of, um, of May um, from 9.30 to 12 in the Project CR Rewrite channel. So the idea is that we just hang out together via the Slack call 
Um, and, you know, you can ask any question. I can show you around about anything. Um, um, we, can, we can focus anything you like, just that you get a better understanding what this actually is about. Um, so I would really love to see you in two weeks from now um, in, in, the, in this Deep Dive QA webinar session and just be free to ask any question and I would be really happy to answer them. So thank you so much. That was the update of the Event Source Content Repository and I'm looking forward to a short discussion. Yeah, thank you Sebastian, Bernhard and Bastian for these great insights uh, about also the progress you made there. And um, I, I can only uh, emphasize like, like what Sebastian just said, uh, if you feel overwhelmed by that, then then just don't, right? Let, uh, let me let me yeah? ask him one question yeah? because okay. we have him right here. <laughs> um, <laughs> will I need to learn a new language, or are, will you be able to somehow, you know, th th those huge words you're using and subgraph yeah. dimension yeah. repository point <laughs> something? <laughs> um, do I need a dictionary for that, or is that? No. Uh, How do we handle that? Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, to the user's perspective, not very many things change. So that means the user interface doesn't change at all. The fusion code you write doesn't change at all. Um, they're just very bits. Like if you write an importer, for instance, which I creates nodes, this will change a bit. But um, it's you know, it's you don't need to understand these lower layers to build these kind of things. And we will, of course, help with documentation and examples and so on and so on with that. So actually, um, although that's such a big change behind the scenes, the impact on the outside world in terms of the API is actually rather small, and that is really important. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. We're thank you, Sebastian. Really looking forward to getting our hands on the new content repository implementation. Uh, also, a big thanks again to Bastian and Bernhard who uh, joined you for your uh, talk today. Uh, thanks for getting up so early on a Saturday morning. Um, <laughs> you too. Uh, thank you very much. That was awesome.